And I'll just add to William's comments. Uh, you know, if there are any questions about the things that uh, that I've presented, you know, something that could be made more clear, or if you have any concern about something that I've said, please come and talk to me about it because I, I'm interested in nothing but truth, nothing but truth, and I hope you are too. And as we seek that together, uh, we ought to be testing one another, making sure we understand what is the truth that God has revealed. If you're listening to this lesson online or in some other format, we want you to contact the congregation here if you have such questions uh, that you might uh, be able to, to have them addressed. Like I've said multiple times in the lesson so far, if you hear something and it doesn't make sense to you, don't just throw it off, turn off your brain and say, well, I'm not going to think about it anymore. You ask about it. <laughs> you go and find what the truth really is, because only then will you be blessed. Yes. God has given us truth, and, and it really is rich for us to be able to have times like this where we can sit and just just bask in, in how wonderful it is that God is as glorious as he is. Uh, we are going to continue. I'm not going to talk about Mr. Stoner. We, we talked about him in the first hour, nor his quote, the, uh, the, the one in 10 to the 17th. But I do want to come back to this slide here. Uh, in our first lesson, we talked about the prophecy that Christ would be born in Bethlehem. The second lesson, we talked about the forerunner and the entering into Jerusalem on, on the donkey. Uh, this past lesson, we talked to the prophecy about how the servant, when he comes, uh, would, as a sheep before its shears is silent, open not his mouth. What we're going to do in this lesson is talk about the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth prophecies that Mr. Stoner considered. We're going to talk about them as a group because they are all connected by Mr. Stoner to the betrayal of Jesus and they all come from the Old Testament book of Zechariah, which dates to 500 years before Jesus. Um, the first one that he considered, number four here, in his list was the statement in Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 6 which says, and one will say to him, what are these wounds between your arms or hands? And then he will answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Here's what Mr. Stoner has to say about this prophecy. He says, Christ was betrayed by Judas, one of his disciples, causing him to be put to death, wounds being made in his hand. And he goes on to say, one man in how many the world over has been betrayed by a friend and that betrayal has resulted in his being wounded in his hands. And the student said that it was very rare to be betrayed by a friend and still rarer for the betrayal to involve wounding in the hands. One in a thousand was finally agreed upon, though most of the students would have preferred a larger number. So he said, we'll use one in 10 to the third power, one in a thousand. Friends, if you've never looked at this prophecy or considered it closely, you might be surprised to hear me say that I don't believe Zechariah 13 and verse 6 is a prophecy of the Messiah. And that Mr. Stoner is actually wrong to use it this way. Yes, in history you'll find quite a few commenters and books out there from, who will make the same claim that he does, but nowhere does the New Testament quote this as a messianic prophecy, and I believe that the words of Zechariah show that it's not a prophecy of the, of the Messiah. And so I want you to turn over to Zechariah 13, and we'll look at this together. And again, I'll say that if you disagree with my conclusions, I'd like you afterward to let, let me know that. If there's something I, I need to understand better, then, uh, then I would love your correction and I would make it right. But I want you to see what I have seen. Let me cover the point briefly. If you go over to Zechariah chapter 13, uh, here's what I want to say about it. Number one, yes... Chapter 12 and verse 10 refers to the time of the Messiah when it says, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. 
I'm sure Mr. Stoner would agree that's a, a messianic prophecy. Chapter 13 and verse 1 speaks of that same time period and says, In that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And I say, yes, that verse refers to the time of the Messiah and the salvation that he would bring. I'm sure Mr. Mr. Stoner would agree with that. But now verse 2 through 6 refers to how God in this day was going to cleanse his people of idolatry and I believe false prophets and the unclean spirit. And let's just read verses 3 to 6 together. Uh, we'll start at verse 2. Right? We'll read 2 through 6 and let's see everything in context. It says, it shall be in that day, the day of verse 1, the day of chapter 12, verse 10, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land and they shall no longer be remembered. I will also cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to depart from the land. It shall come to pass that if anyone still prophesies, then his father and mother who begot him will say to him, You shall not live, because you've spoken lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and mother who begot him shall thrust him through when he prophesies. And it shall be in that day that every prophet will be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies. They will not wear a robe of coarse hair to deceive, but he will say, I'm no prophet. I'm a farmer. For a man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. And one will say to him, what are these wounds between your arms? And he will answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Let me tell you what I think the context is saying. This picture is of false prophets who try to hide themselves because they're afraid of being judged. They, it says they'll not wear a prophet's clothes. They'll not claim to be a prophet. I'm just a farmer. They'll hide the wounds on their body, on their chest, between their arms. That's what different translations say. By saying, only the King James uses hands. And they'll say it's because they don't want to be, or they'll say this because they don't want to be identified as a prophet. And we can talk about why does this person have wounds. I think there's a few explanations for that. It's interesting in the Old Testament we read that false prophets would often cut themselves and things like that. I, we can talk about that. But I think there's enough information there to see that this person in verse 6 is representative of a false prophet. That's not Messiah. And so what I think we learn here is, is that we, we do need to take the time to step back and look. When somebody you know, claims a verse means something, always take a step back, look at it, look at the context, look at the verses before and after it, and make sure that it's being understood properly. Our goal of defending the Word of God is harmed when we accept something as true that we've not tested ourselves. Right? And we, that, that means we need to spend time in the Scriptures, even with very difficult things. Now, I say that again with the idea that if you see something there in those verses that I'm misunderstanding, letting me know, let me know. I want to understand it properly. But in the context, I don't believe verse 6 refers to Messiah. Now, I do want you to see what Jesus says in John 13, beginning in verse 18. Over in John chapter 13, this is when Jesus has his apostles together on the night before he's arrested uh, and betrayed. It's when they, you know, they, uh, Jesus is teaching them and preparing them. The Lord's Supper is instituted. John chapter 18, uh, oh no, sorry, John 13, beginning in verse 18. Here's what Jesus says. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I've chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. Quote, he who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Down in verse 21, he says, When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. You see, in these verses, Jesus does make the claim that there was scripture that indicated he would be betrayed by someone close to him. But it's not Zechariah 13 he turns to. It's actually Psalm 41 that he references. But we're not going to look at Psalm 41 in this series of lessons, but I will refer to it briefly in the next lesson. So there was prophecy relating to being betrayed by someone close, but I don't think Zechariah 13 is it. So with that in mind, we're going to go on to the next two prophecies that Mr. Stoner references, number five and six in his list. And those are in Zechariah chapter 11, 
verses 12 and 13. Prophecies about 30 pieces of silver and about how they were connected to a potter. Take your Bibles and turn to Zechariah chapter 9, first of all. Go back to Zechariah if you turned away from it. Go to chapter 9. We're going, to be, we're going to work our way to chapter 11, but I want to start in 9 because the context of chapter 11 begins at least in chapter 9 where we learn that God was going to protect and defend Israel in the days of the Grecian Empire under Alexander the Great, even while other nations and city-states like Tyre and the Philistine cities would be crushed. Concerning Israel in chapter 9 and verse 16, look at chapter 9 and verse 16, talking about Israel. Chapter 9 and verse 16, it says, The Lord their God will save them in that day as the flock of his people, for they shall be like the jewels of a crown, lifted like a banner over his land. So Israel in this verse is referred to as God's flock, sheep, right? That God would defend, and there's certainly some messianic, messages in this chapter too. In fact, you might have seen just in the middle of this chapter, verses 9 and 10, or verses we've already talked about, the king that's coming on the donkey. But, but, but what I want you to see is just that term in verse 16 where God references people as a flock. Right? Israel is a flock. You go to chapter 10. Chapter 10 of Zechariah refers to the future blessings God's going to bring to his true people. But in verses 2 and 3, there's a problem. Chapter 10, verses 2 and 3, there's a problem affecting God's flock. There's weakness there. Look at verse 2. For the idols speak delusion, the diviners envision lies, and they tell false dreams. They comfort in vain, therefore the people wend their way like sheep. They are in trouble because there's no shepherd. My anger is kindled against the shepherds, and I will punish the goat herds. For the Lord of hosts will visit his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them as his royal force in the battle. God is angry in these verses because the shepherds, the leaders and the teachers of his people are not guiding his flock in truth and in love. And for that reason, in verse 2, the NIV translates this, Therefore the people wander like sheep oppressed for lack of a shepherd. Though there were many times in Israel's history that you could say the statement was true of them. They were like sheep without a shepherd. It most certainly was true in the days of Jesus. You might remember his words in Matthew 9 and verse 36. It says, when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. You keep reading Zechariah 10. Zechariah 10 has this promise that God is going to whistle for his true sheep and call them together and redeem them and they will grow stronger again. And so as we come into chapter 11, we're going to look at verses 4 through 14. We are in the middle of this picture of the Lord's flock of sheep that has been led astray and ruined by the shepherds. And, and what we're going to find is that it appears that in these verses, chapter 11, 4 through 14, God is going to ask Zechariah to perform certain actions, kind of like acting out a scene in order to teach the people. This is not an unusual thing among the prophets. Do you remember how like, Jeremiah was told to break a flask of pottery in the sight of some of the Israelite elders in order to teach them how Israel was going to be broken and could never be made whole again? when God's judgment came. Do you remember how Hosea was told to marry the harlot Gomer to teach about Israel's unfaithfulness and God's forgiveness? Well, in these verses, Zechariah becomes a shepherd over a flock that was marked to be slaughtered, and he feeds it. We're going to talk about how that sheep respond, how that flock responds to him as after we read. We're going to read 4 through 14 all at once. It's a long section, but just try to, you know, Try to keep as much of it in as you can. It's not an easy section. It, it, these are not easy verses. And uh, having already had one hour, we're, we're already, <laughs> our, our brain power is already kind of lower than it was when we first got here. But we're going we're gonna to push through 
And I'm going to try to make things clear after we read through. Verse 4, beginning. Thus says the Lord my God, feed the flock for slaughter, whose owners slaughter them and feel no guilt. Those who sell them say, blessed be the Lord, for I'm rich. And their shepherds do not pity them. For I will no longer pity the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord. But indeed, I will give everyone into his neighbor's hand and into the hand of his king. They shall attack the land, and I will not deliver them from their hand. So, Zechariah says, I fed the flock for slaughter. In particular, the poor of the flock. I took for myself two staffs, shepherd staffs. The one I called beauty, and the other I called bonds, and I fed the flock. I dismissed the three shepherds in one month. My soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. Then I said, I will not feed you. Let what is dying die, and what is perishing perish. Let those that are left eat each other's flesh. And I took my staff beauty and cut it in two, that I might break the covenant which I had made with all the peoples. So it was broken on that day. Thus the poor of the flock who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord. Then I said to them, if it is agreeable to you, give me my wages, and if not, refrain. And so they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, that princely price they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. Then I cut into my other staff bonds that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. Okay. <laughs> now, I'm going to try the best I can to make some things clear, at least as I understand it. And I'm going to give you the same exhortation again. If you see something that I've missed, I want you to bring that to my attention afterward. But here's some things that I note that help me in my understanding of these verses. Number one, though it is possible that Zechariah literally and actually became a shepherd act out the scene. Right now, I think it's more likely that in these verses, he's acting out the role of a shepherd in a vision. This is a vision that's going on. If you go back and read chapters 1 to 8, you'll see that Zechariah reports on several visions that he has seen. And he doesn't say, you know, I had a vision, and here's what it's, you know, sometimes it's just presented. Here it is. Notice that in verse 9, Zechariah says, I will not feed you. Let what is dying die, and what is perishing perish. Let me ask you a simple question. Who is Zechariah talking to? Sheep. He's talking to sheep. Now think about that. Zechariah is talking to sheep. <laughs> uh, is that a little strange? <laughs> Verse 11 says, the poor, the afflicted of the flock, the New American Standard says, the poor of the flock, the New King James, were watching Zechariah when he broke the first shepherd's staff. And it says that they, quote, knew that it was the word of the Lord. And I think to myself, those are some smart sheep. <laughs> they knew it was the word of the Lord. Verse 12 says that Zechariah asked if they will pay him wages or not. Who did he ask grammatically the sheep? is who he asked. <laughs> You're asking the sheep, what will they pay you? See, what we're to understand is that I think this is not literally and actually something that happen. It, it is something that's being acted out and it's in a vision. There's some meaning to all of these things, right? Secondly, this helps me to realize that what Zachariah is doing in this vision is supposed to represent someone or something else. If you look in verse 15, which we haven't read yet, you will see that right after this, Zechariah is next called to take on the role and appearance of a foolish shepherd. Look at that. Verse 15, the Lord said to me, Next, take for yourself the implements of a foolish shepherd. For, indeed, I will raise up a shepherd in the land who will not care for those who are cut off nor seek the young, nor heal those that are broken, nor feed those that still stand, but he'll eat the flesh of the fat and tear the hooves in pieces. And we're not, we're not going to talk about what this is, but you see Zacharias being told in verse 15 to take up the implements of a foolish shepherd because he's going to represent something or someone else that God is going to raise up. 
That's after verses 4 through 14, where Zacharias first called to act out the part of a good shepherd who comes to feed a flock that has not been cared for and fed, but rather mistreated and taken advantage of. And he removes the place of the former bad shepherds. That's in verse 8. And he gives the flocks food and he gives special attention to the poor and the afflicted. But the flock does what? Rejects him, generally. It's, some would debate this, and you can see that different translations handle it different ways, but in verse 8, the New King James says, My soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. Who's he talking about? I believe, my understanding, is he's talking about the sheep. It goes on in verse 9, Then I said, I will not feed you. Verse 9 happens because of, uh, of a result of the last thing said in verse 8. Verse 8, My soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. He's talking about the sheep. And then I said, verse 9, I will not feed you. Let what is dying die. The NIV translation says this, The flock detested me, and I grew weary of them. I admit that's an interpretive translation. The word flock is not in verse 8, but I just read that to show they have judged. It is the flock that detested this good shepherd, and the shepherd grew weary of them. The flock chose not to appreciate what the shepherd was doing for them. That's why the shepherd is wearied with them. That's why he leaves them in the next verse. It's also why down in verse 15, God says, I'm going to send a foolish shepherd afterward. Right? Who's not going to take care of them. So with all this in mind, I come back to this question. Who does this good shepherd represent? Who is Zechariah meant to represent? I think we should first notice he's identified with God because when he breaks these staffs, it's, it, it says in verse 10, covenant was broken. And in verse 11, it says the poor of the flock understood what he was doing was the word of the Lord. So this good shepherd is representing God's actions. right? But I think it's a little bit deeper than that as well. And to help you see that, I'm going to have you keep a marker here in Zechariah and turn back to Ezekiel, chapter 34. Mr. Stoner says Zechariah 13, the Good Shepherd, is the Messiah. And what we need to do is take a step back and say, well, you know, is that true? The word Messiah is nowhere in Zechariah 13. That's why I have us here in Ezekiel 34. Do you remember how in the last lesson we looked at the book of Isaiah and saw how the first part of the book prophesied about the great King Messiah, son of David, who would one day rule. The second part of the book talked about the servant of God who would one day come. And the descriptions of the two were similar in a lot of ways, except for the fact the king would be strong and victorious and the servant of God were going to be, you know, but they were the same person, servant, king, right? Well, in Ezekiel 34, there's an amazing and emotional prophecy, emotional, about God shepherding his people. This chapter is awesome to me. I'd love to take the time to just read the whole thing. I'm not going to do that. But I do want to read parts of it. Ezekiel prophesied very close in time with Zechariah. And I want you to look beginning in verse 1. It says, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, Prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who are sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away or sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. And so they were scattered because there was no shepherd. You keep reading through the rest of verses 1 to 10, and what God says is he's going to deliver his sheep from the mouths of these wicked shepherds who are feeding themselves. 
In verses 11 through 16, there are beautiful words about how God will search for and gather his sheep. Look at verse 11. For thus says the Lord God, indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out as a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he's among his scattered sheep. So I will seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. Look down at verse 15. I will feed my flock. And I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away, bind up the broken and strengthen what was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment. So, you know, a lot of that is God saying that these beautiful things he's going to do for his sheep. But did you notice at the end of verse 16, there's another problem. Another problem. Not only are the wicked shepherds a problem for God's true sheep, but there are other sheep that are problems for God's true sheep. And that's what God talks about in verses 17 through 22. Let's read beginning in verse 20. Verse 20 says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I myself will judge between the fat and the lean sheep. Because you have pushed with side and shoulder, butted all the weak ones with your horns and scattered them abroad, therefore I will save my flock and they shall no longer be a prey and I will judge between sheep and sheep. He's going to judge between sheep and sheep. Do you remember how in Zechariah's prophecy there was made a difference in the sheep? You know, there, was, there was the general sheep and then there was the poor of the flock who knew it was the word of the Lord. That, that's what's being described here. And then in verses 23 and 24, read those two verses. I will establish one shepherd over them, my flock, and he shall feed them, my servant David. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. We read those two verses last night. And we said, those verses aren't talking about God appointing David literally as shepherd over his flock. David had died a hundred, uh, hundreds of years before Ezekiel. All of the Jewish people knew that this reference to David the prince, David the shepherd who would be over the people was a reference to Messiah. It was a clear understanding from the Old Testament prophets that Messiah, when he came, was going to be a shepherd king. And, verse, uh, and, and that's what this chapter is about. The shepherd king coming and, 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 and taking his flock and blessing them and protecting them and healing them. There is beautiful words through the rest of this chapter. I'd love to read, but I'm just going to read the very last verse of the chapter. Verse 31 says, you are my flock, the flock of my pasture. You are men and I am your God, says the Lord God. I'm going to bless you. The idea of the shepherd king was very well understood. In fact... You are probably pretty familiar with John chapter 10, which is a record of Jesus' words that were spoken uh, when he gave the teaching, I am the good shepherd. Remember this? Hey, John chapter 10, I want you to flip over there. Look, look beginning in verse 11. John chapter 10, verse 11. <clears throat> Jesus says, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and he flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he's a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. And I know my sheep and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. We've studied these words many times. Talked about what it means to, that Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. Talked about what it means to hear his voice and follow him. But maybe we've not always read these verses with the realization that his Jewish listeners 
would know the prophecies about the Messiah being God's shepherd king. And as he's saying these words, they would understand clearly that he was making a claim to be that. One shepherd, one flock. Look at verse 19. Uh, if you've got a red letter Bible, that's where the red ends because Jesus is just, you know, just finished saying these things. Verse 19 says, therefore, because of his words, there was a division again among the Jews because of him. There's some fighting. And you go down to verse 24 and it says, then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Do you see why they would ask that question at this point? Uh, look at his answer, by the way, verse 25. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. And I, he is telling them he is the Christ. He's just not saying, I am the Christ. He's saying, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the one shepherd. I'm putting together the one flock. That's pretty cool to see, right? They understood that's what he was claiming. And they just said, be plain about it. Is the shepherd that Zechariah portrayed in Zechariah 11 the same as Messiah? Go back to Zechariah chapter 11 now. Go back to Zechariah chapter 11. What do we learn about Zechariah shepherd? Well, Zechariah shepherd was going to be rejected generally by the flock. Zachariah shepherd would give up shepherding the flock and he would go to the flock and ask them if it's good in your sight give me my wages and if not refrain in, in other words and those are the words in, in verse 12 in other words here's what he's saying flock I have fed you I have labored over you I have helped you and if it seems good to you if it seems right to you if it seems best to you give me what you think I should have notice he doesn't demand wages he asks what am I worth for what I have done? If you judge me worth anything, give me my wages. And Zechariah says 500 years before Jesus, they weighed out 30 pieces of silver. That's how much he's worth. Several commentators point out that in Exodus 21 and verse 32, that 30 pieces of silver was the price to replace a slave that had been gored by an ox, according to the law of Moses 900 years earlier. The price of a slave to replace. That law had been written 900 years earlier, so my mind immediately wonders, you know, what, what were 30 pieces of silver worth in Zechariah's day? And studies have been produced along that line and people talk about those questions. And to me, I don't think that's the most important thing actually to answer. That, to me, the most important thing to realize that in, is that in verse 13, Zechariah is told not to keep the 30 pieces of silver, but to do what? To throw it to the potter and it says that princely price they set on me. Various translations say that handsome price they set on me. That magnificent price they set on me. That lordly price they set on me. That exorbitant sum they set on me. That, goodless, that goodly price. That splendid price. Look, you know from the context that these sheep who loathe and reject the shepherd are not now giving him a bag of priceless treasure fit for a king. That is not what that phrase means. This is sarcasm. This is when you say something that is the opposite of what you really want to say because you're, you're, you're irritated, frustrated, or you're intending to show your disapproval. It's like when somebody does something dumb and you say, oh, that was smart. You don't really mean that was smart. You're, you're being sarcastic. These 30 pieces showed their absolute lack of respect for his value. That's what he had to throw it to the throw it away that princely price they set on me. It was not a true princely price. What it was was an insult. In fact, it's probably more of an insult and disrespect than if they paid him nothing. 
the Lord tells him to cast it into the house of the Lord for the potter, it wasn't worth keeping. We ask ourselves the question again, could this really be Messiah, the shepherd king of Ezekiel 34? In Matthew chapter 26, In Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 14, we read that one of the apostles of Jesus, Judas, a man who had been selected for the service of God among the inner circle of Christ, a man who had seen so many signs and wonders, a man who had heard all the wonderful teachings of the one who called himself the Good Shepherd, this man, Judas, went to the chief priests and scribes and elders and captains. And it says in Matthew 26 and verse 14, one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. What will you give me if I deliver him to you? And they said, he's worth 30 pieces of silver to us. And Judas said, all right, he's worth 30 pieces of silver. And he took it. And Judas's betrayal led to Jesus's arrest. Jesus's arrest led to Jesus's conviction by the Sanhedrin. Jesus's conviction led him to being in front of Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, who, as we've already said, found nothing wrong with him. Matthew chapter 27, verses 15 through 26. Again, those are the verses where Pilate says, I'll release to you Jesus or I'll release to you the, the murderous, rebellious man. And they said, crucify Jesus. I think that what we're supposed to see, if we kind of put everything together, is that any one of these people who shouted that Jesus should be gotten rid of and crucified would have thought he was no worth no more than 30 pieces of silver. They would have done the same. <laughs> yeah, take money for it? Sure. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 3 beginning. Judas, as he sees these things happening, becomes remorseful. He, he feels guilty. It says in verse 3, Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying... I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. And he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed. And he went and hanged himself. But the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it's not lawful to put them into the treasury because they're the price of blood. And they consulted together and they bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. And therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. What was done with the 30 pieces of silver? They were thrown down in the house of the Lord and they were used to buy a potter's field, a worthless field full of ruined pottery that would be used to bury strangers. Isn't that amazing? The pieces thrown down in the temple for the potter. I would argue it'd be foolish of Matthew to record these facts if they were not true. Many people were actually involved in this betrayal of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea, who gave up his own tomb for Jesus to be buried in, was a disciple of Jesus who was on the Sanhedrin. I think he would likely have known what was happening. The potter would have known who bought the field and for how much. And in Acts chapter 1, we learn that in the very same field, Judas went and hanged himself. It would not be terribly difficult to find out about 30 pieces of silver. We can have great confidence these things really did happen. <clears throat> Mr. Stoner says this as he thinks about what's going on here. Of the people who have been betrayed, one in how many has been betrayed for exactly 30 pieces of silver? It says the students thought that this would be an extremely rare thing and set their estimate as 1 in 10,000 or 1 in 10 to the 4th. And he said, we'll use 1 in 10 to the 3rd. <laughs> we'll use 1 in 1,000. Um, he's being conservative again. 
Now, how about the other prophecy? The, the prophecy that the 30 would be used to, uh, uh, would be thrown to the potter. Right. He says this is extremely specific. All 30 pieces of silver are not to be returned. They are to be cast down in the house of the Lord, and they are to go to the potter. You'll recall that Judas in remorse tried to return the 30 pieces of silver, and cut the chief, but the chief priest would not accept them. So Judas threw them down on the floor of the temple, and he went and hanged himself. The chief priest then took the money and bought a field of the potter to bury strangers in. Here's what Stoner says. Our question is, one man and how many, after receiving a bribe for the betrayal of a friend, had returned the money, had it refused, thrown it down on the floor in the house of the Lord, and then had it used to purchase a field from the potter. The student said they doubted if there's ever been another incident involving all these items. But they agreed on an estimate of one in a hundred thousand. They were very sure that this was conservative. Notice Mr. Stoner doesn't argue with that one. He says, well, all right, we'll use one in a hundred thousand. And his point is, the details in that, that came true in Jesus, are ridiculously uh, improbable. Even if you don't agree with his numbers, you see his point. It's amazing to see that these things happened with Jesus. And especially it's amazing that such things should happen to one who had been born in Bethlehem, had a forerunner to prepare his way, rode a donkey into Jerusalem as king, who was despised and rejected and yet has influenced the entire earth for over 2,000 years, meeting all of the prophecies that we've talked about and more, the 30 pieces of silver thrown to the potter came true of him as well. And Mr. Stoner is saying, this is amazing stuff. <laughs> we should point out Obviously, the prophecy of Zechariah isn't literal in the sense that the shepherd himself, Jesus himself, did not throw down the money in the temple. But that's the nature of some prophecies we've already talked about. There's meaning, real meaning in those prophecies, but that, that, that doesn't mean you know, that you're going to have literal things happen all the time. Like we said, David is the shepherd in Ezekiel 34. Actually, Messiah is the shepherd. People understood that. There, there, is, there is a symbolic thing going on in this vision of Zechariah as shepherd. And what that vision is supposed to help us see is how people valued that shepherd. He was worth nothing to them. He had fed them. He had cared for them when they had been so afflicted. He had done so much to help them and yet, finally, when they despise him and loathe him, and he says, look, I'm not going to demand wages. You just pay me what you think I'm worth, if I'm worth anything to you. And they threw out that princely price. 30 pieces of silver, which was nothing. What we're challenged to think about by this vision, this, this was God's intent, is that, that we're to think about how would we value that shepherd? The, 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 the question is, how much is Jesus worth to you? Is he worth 30 pieces of silver? Is he worth more than 30 pieces of silver to you? Your, your answer would probably be, of course, he's worth more than 30 pieces of silver. To, I would not trade Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, but what price would you trade him at? That's the hard question. That, that's the cutting question. What price would you trade him at? What price do you put on him? When you turn inward and look at your life and you see that you're trading off Jesus and his blessings and his will for you for something else that you want in life. You're living inconsistent with the Lord's will because you are, you are saying, I value this really 
more than Jesus. Well, that's the price you're putting on him. Is there really any price worth creating Jesus for? Is there any price it would be worth selling him at to you? If the shepherd is who the scripture said he would be, there is nothing on earth you should be willing to trade for. Tomorrow we're going to look at Psalm 22. We're going to talk about the crucifixion of Jesus and how it was prophesied. We're going to talk about um, the life that he gave for us. The life that sets us free from our sins. And I hope you'll come back if you're able to and be a part of that. I'm thankful for everybody who traveled today who can't be here tomorrow. And I hope you were encouraged by our time together today. I hope that last question has made you think. And if there's any price you have been trading Jesus away for, I hope you'll, you'll repent of that that you'll see Jesus' true value and you'll see his love for you and how he wants to heal and bind you up and and care for you as the good shepherd does for his sheep. There's some way here this morning that we can encourage you, uh, help you to draw near to that shepherd. We want you to let us know. Will you lead us in song?